name's Meg Linton. I'm the CEO of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation, and you're here today to participate in a studio chat with Holly Tempo. Um, I first met Holly while we were both working at Otis College of Art and Design, and Holly is an artist, a painter, a teacher. Um, she has shown at uh, the California African American Museum of Art, LACMA, at the Art and Film Lab, and locally she has shown at the Irvine Fine Art Center, the Orange County Center for Contemporary Art, and the Huntington Beach Art Center. Um, in addition to being a fabulous artist, uh, Holly is also in her kind of consulting life. She is a mentor and coach to artists kind of coming into the field. So Holly, we're really thrilled to have you today as part of the Library Foundation <laughs> Studio Chat program. Um, so why don't we go ahead and start, you know, we, when we did our practice session, we were talking about your dog, your house, your neighborhood, <laughs> and kind of what it's been like working during a pandemic. Yeah, well, thanks for, so much for having me, uh, Meg. I'm really excited about having this conversation and sharing a bit of my reality, such as it is with you and, and all the viewers. Um, I want to start with... Um, some video footage. Um, what you see on the screen is my little dog. His name is Dilip, which is an East Indian name. It sort of sounds like Philip, but with a D. And I'm going to run the video without sound so that we can talk. But basically what you'll be seeing is a very typical morning walk that I'll be taking with Dilip um, around the neighborhood um, that also functions not only in terms of him and I getting exercise, but also as a source material for my paintings. So let me go ahead and start that. Let's see here. Boom. There we go. There's Dilip. Dilip is 10 and a half now, by the way. <laughs> so he's getting up there. So uh, should I just go through my little, uh, well, we'll let this run and then we'll, we'll talk more. But do you, I guess what I can say about uh, what's playing is that um, I'm sort of showing uh, what I see. I live in a very um, typical neighborhood in Northeast Inglewood. If any of you know the South Bay area, uh, Inglewood is a community uh, undergoing a lot of growth right now and um, a lot of change, some of which is exciting and some of which is worrying for many people. And it's a very typical uh, neighborhood. It's blue collar, it's a family neighborhood where I live. I've, I've been in the house that I purchased uh, for seven years and um, have met actually quite a few of my neighbors because of walking the dog. So what we're approaching, you see up on the left, the mustard colored building is actually Will's Market. And that's the sort of neighborhood corner market, but it also became a source of inspiration for me because a lot of um, uh, the gangs that are passed through the area tag um, that side of the building that you're seeing as we approach. and then there is often uh, the graffiti abatement where the marks are painted out. And so that's something that you'll see later as we continue our talk has been of much interest to me. So when you talk about the graffiti, it's, it's the graffiti that's being written, but also being covered over. Yes. So, so kind of uh, the kind of graffiti I tend to see on this building is it's, my particular area, it's uh, brown gangs, so it's Latinx gangs, and um, they often use black or sort of dark blue markers, sometimes red, and uh, they'll put, you know, the different um, sort of uh, territorial, I guess, information on the building, and then um, somebody will call probably the owners of the market and will have the uh, graffiti abatement team come and paint it out. So then you get those big sort of blotches. Here, you can see um, two different colors because uh, they had, the gang had covered quite a bit of the wall. So instead of just being sort of a floating blotch of color on the wall, they actually covered a very large section. And as an abstract painter, I've always been sort of obsessed with those floating blotches because they never ever match the color, <laughs> which I know isn't completely the point, but um, as you can see in this case, it's not even close. So I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by that. Um, and then, of course, it ends up reading like some kind of strange, you know, dystopic uh, Mark Rothko <laughs> intervention. There's a little bit of graffiti yeah. um, you see on the steps. 
Well, when I was studying Latin and ancient Rome, they would talk about the graffiti in some of the translations we were doing and how they would just get whitewashed over and over and over so that if you actually, as a historian or archaeologist, digest the layers, you can see the political leanings and the conversations that take place and mm -hmm. the messaging people were leaving each other. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Thing. And, you know, I think, if I'll go to the next slide now, the video is over. Um, I think it's interesting, I'll talk about this in a minute, that, um, you know, the area where I live in is, is often considered, you know, people think it might be dangerous and that there's gangs everywhere and people are shooting at everybody. And it's really not like that. Um, of course, there are problems with crime. There are gangs in the area, but um, most of the time it's pretty quiet. And the, the sounds that you'll hear are the sounds of children playing and birds and you know, dogs and uh, people chatting and, you know, I say hello to my neighbors as I walk by and feel very safe in the area. So I think it's interesting sometimes that the perception um, doesn't always match uh, the reality. And of course, living in an urban area, you can be in one section where, you know, it's fine and then two blocks away, it's not so great. So the reality of living of life uh, here. This image that you see is of my doggy Dilip, and the left or before image is when I found him running as a puppy about eight months old in the street. And um, you can see how traumatized he was um, and how underweight. And, uh, and then after, of course, now his delightful little bubbly self, and he sort of rules the roost around here. So, um, but just showing, um, <clears throat> this is kind of a theme in my work is sort of taking something, putting it through my filter, and hopefully improving it or making something meaningful. So of course, in reality, with my dog. And, and right now, during this whole situation with COVID, I have to say, thank God, I have a pet. Uh, I can't imagine going through this situation as someone who lives alone without some other form of life in the space with me would be really pretty unbearable. Yeah. And speaking of COVID, so I wanted to put these images. I've been posting a lot on Instagram, which I'm not normally a big social media person. And I think prior to the whole pandemic, um, the last time I'd posted was maybe in November 2019. But all of a sudden, I find myself on there a lot. It's a way, I guess, of connecting with people. So um, like many people in the earlier months of this whole situation, you know, we were all frightened and didn't know what was happening. And sort of losing our minds. So I did this quick series of self-portraits I called Pandemic Pathos. And so the one you see on the left um, is one that's gotten a lot of um, interest and attention um, on my Instagram account. Just shows me basically wearing a mask and trying not to lose my mind, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and then uh, the, the photo on the right, uh, taken just a couple of days ago, um, is you know the, sort of the improved Holly um, trying to find ways to cope during the situation that are healthier, that um, reflect self-care. So um, that's something that's becoming really important to me is, you know, I'm doing a lot of meditation, um, I'm taking online exercise classes, I'm talking with friends, you know, anything that can be done to make life bearable um, in these unprecedented times. And you're back to making art. And what? And you're back to making art. Yeah, exactly. That's true. At the beginning of this whole situation, so um, I was a um, 2020 COLA Master Artist Fellow uh, selected by the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, um, creating work. And we were to have a show in May of this year, uh, so hence the pandemic pathos. And of course, was in the process of working on my paintings. I had these large paintings I was doing. Suddenly, uh, the pandemic was announced, and suddenly I found myself, I felt as if I couldn't breathe, as I think many people yeah. did, couldn't breathe and couldn't work. I could not make these large paintings, which takes a lot of physical energy of, you know, moving across the canvas, working with the body. I felt like I literally couldn't paint. And that went on for about Holly, three to four let's, weeks. Let's see some of your paintings while you're okay. talking about them. Yeah. So, oh, as we skip through, also just a little bit more about my environment. So this is my house um, that I actually uh, rent out to tenants now. This is in Inglewood. You'll see this is my studio. So what I've done is I've converted my garage into, which is popularly known as an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit, but it's actually a live work art studio. So um, you can see different um, from the exterior to the interior. 
Also some images. Uh, I went to Claremont Graduate, at the time it was Claremont Graduate School and not university. Um, was one of the few painters in the program. This was in the late 80s, early 90s when um, installation was making a big splash in the art world. So it was kind of an interesting time to be a painter. But I was very fortunate to study with the late, great Carl Benjamin, um, who I was really influenced um, you know, of, of, as a modernist artist and also uh, by his formalism. And then also uh, very influenced by Roland Rees, who was the head of the department at the time. Uh, doing postmodernist, very conceptual work. And I think these two um, sort of represent a marriage of some of what you see in my work, which is the formal and the conceptual together within uh, abstract painting. So now we get to the painting. And uh, this is kind of a turning point painting, which is why I put it at the beginning, even though it's dated back to 2012. Uh, my response sort of in terms of gesture, in terms of line, in terms of um, sort of using abstraction as a way to communicate what's going on in my environment, not only physically, but also culturally and socially. So storm warning in the hood, cold front storm warning in the hood starts to have um, implications beyond obviously just that there's weather problems. It also has to do with problems with within the community, um, problems experienced by the community from outside forces and how that impacts us all. These are some images uh, just to show you a little bit about how I uh, take visual cues from my environment and translate them into painting. So a lot of times you'll see lines and hard edges that appear in my paintings. Of course, I, I was fortunate enough to have Carl teach me his technique. I begged him to show me his masking technique because he was a master at it, which he was kind enough to do. And um, also the shapes and gestures that you see here. Um, we've got the, on the right side, that uh, blue floating and the white floating shapes are the graffiti abatement. And then you see the, the gestures of graffiti. So that gives you a sense of that. This is a painting. So you're really pulling your palette. So Holly, you're really uh -huh. pulling your palette from the street. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I would definitely consider myself a colorist. Um, and, you know, I've, I've taught color theory. I've studied it. Um, and, in fact, I still have notes from my days at graduate school. Roland Rees gave, I believe it was a four-hour lecture about color and took no copious notes and still have them to, these day, to this day. But, yes, um, influenced by color, not only in terms of what I'm seeing, but colors that reference feelings and emotions and situations. So, for example, in this painting, I did this right after there was a shooting um, in the former studio space that I lived in, in Inglewood, right outside my studio. It was very frightening. And so I use these sort of day glow warning colors that you see a lot in um, construction and perhaps even at crime scenes, uh, sort of letting people know to stay back, stay away, or be on alert. Uh, and so this the title of this painting actually comes from a quote by the filmmaker Werner Herzog. Uh, he talked about being in Venice and hearing of a shooting uh, while he was with some friends back, I guess, in the 90s, and how um, whoever did the shooting, the young man was a gang member, shot two uh, tourists, and uh, right before he shot them, he said, this is for real, and then killed them. Uh, really disturbing story, but I realized that there was some uh, connection even to the environment that I was living in, uh, you know, 10, 20 years later. This painting is actually influenced by uh, that wall at that corner market that you saw earlier in the video, that sort of mustard colored wall. I call this one Frustrated Mayans at the Corner Market. So that's, it's a nod to Latinx sort of origins, ancient, ancient history and origins, of course, a very proud Mayan and Aztec culture, and then the, the urban reality, um, the social cultural reality of many Latinx people living in uh, the community who um, are not perhaps getting the opportunities uh, that perhaps they should be or are entitled to just as human beings. And we're especially seeing that now with COVID because there's a disproportionate number of black and brown people who are contracting and dying uh, from this disease. and um, often have limited access to um, appropriate medical treatment. So 
um, looking back at this painting now that's seven years old, it takes on a different meaning for me. But you see the floating shapes, again, the uh, graffiti abatement, um, the marks uh, across the canvas, the sort of Z marks reference the graffiti marks that I saw uh, at that particular site. Mm. Moving forward, this painting is called R.I.P. Javier, and it's actually based on uh, a, a note, if you will, that I saw carved into the concrete um, as I was walking one morning. I, uh, apparently someone, I'm assuming named Javier, must have been killed or died on that spot. And there must have been a temporary memorial that we often see in the city of, you know, where there'll be candles and balloons and flowers and that kind of thing. So this was a little bit of an homage uh, to an unknown uh, person, an unknown victim, who may or may not Holly. have been gang. Well, Holly, when we talked the other day, you talked about the X. Yes, so the X is really important, and here I'll, that one actually, let's go back. So the X is important because in the language of the streets, if you see an X crossing out a piece of graffiti or perhaps someone's tag, it's a direct threat. It's telling someone you aren't welcome here, and perhaps I may even kill you. Uh, it's interesting on that level. Also, of course, X is a, um, you know, a symbol of geometry. It's also uh, something that slaves used to use when they didn't have the ability to uh, write. Um, they would put an X uh, to sign or indicate their name. Uh, it's also sl a slightly tipped cross. It has a lot of interesting um, meaning associated with it. So I like to use it a lot in my paintings and, um, you know, and in this case, the X's sort of seem to float across, you know, the top of the canvas, um, is sort of a little dance with the spray paint. And then on the bottom, of course, they're much bolder and more intense. And something else to talk about in these paintings is the layers. So now I'll go to the next one. Layers and boundaries. So this painting is called Yellow Abatement. So again, it's speaking to the notion of trying to paint out the, the gesture or the the mark, the profane gesture and mark, or what's perceived as profane. And actually in my paintings, what I do is I actually do make a mark. So I, I sort of tag my own paintings, if you will, and then I, I mark it out. So it's hard to see in the yellow X, but if you look closely and focus on it, um, you can see sort of floating in the middle of it from edge to edge, um, the dark uh, cross that's in there. Um, yeah. And then Again, with these hard edges and these sort of layers of color, of uh, pattern, uh, floating shapes, speaks to this sort of hybridized convergence of realities, that there are a lot of things in the community, uh, no matter where you live, that are rubbing against each other and hitting each other, pinging off of each other, if you will, that are not necessarily compatible, that perhaps may uh, be destructive uh, to one another, or perhaps they can blend and become something new. So that's something I think a lot about when I'm painting is these different sort of areas of experience. So we get to this one. This painting is based on one of the sidewalk memorials that I did see um, across the street. Um, West Boulevard is a cross street uh, for my particular area. And on one side, on the west side of the street, it is um, considered Inglewood on the east side of the streets of LA. So this was a little bit northeast of me. But there was a bunch of uh, blue balloons, blue candles, blue um, uh, head kerchiefs, uh, clearly symbolizing that someone from the Crips gang had been killed um, in this particular area. So I was thinking about that. Um, this is where a lot of the X's come into play. Um, really intensely as patterns. Um, and I think also the idea of abatement becomes more than just painting out, you know, the profane mark. It's also about um, trying to mitigate uh, in the most, I guess, beneficial sense or trying to abolish, you know, and it can become a symbol of, you know, trying to abolish an entire culture, um, you know, trying to um, uh, criminalize people, and not to say that there aren't many people who are criminals who are doing things and tagging, but uh, it's interesting to note that um, actually the origin of many of the black and brown gangs that we experience are actually 
come from the 30s and 40s when black and brown people were being attacked by white gangs, which, and this is something I learned through my research, I did not know this, were being attacked by white gangs and formed their own groups to protect themselves, you know, so that they could be out, um, you know, and not be killed, not be attacked. Um, and that progressed through the different decades. In the 60s, many of the uh, gang members became Black Panthers uh, or uh, Brown Berets, I think was the Latino gang uh, designation. And so many of them were actually political activists and had that sort of intention in terms of what they were doing. In the 70s, um, the uh, Black Panthers, yeah? I just want to interrupt a minute because we got, we did get a question about the blue markings. Okay. Um, if those are representative of anything specific. And then also we're kind of running tight on time. I want okay. to get to the Battle of Marathon. Okay, wow. no worries. So the blue marks, um, you know, they have, they have multiple meanings. Um, you know, for example, in this painting, you can see the spray painted marks. Let me keep going. Here's another one. As far as I'm concerned, they have, uh, they generate, they can be figure, they can be pattern, they can be groups, seen as groups of people, and of course we're speaking in an abstract sense. They can uh, be gestures. So they have sort of multiple designations within the paintings. They also represent my connection physically to the painting. Here we get to uh, the Battle of Marathon. Uh, this is uh, the next three paintings you're going to see are paintings that I created for the COLA uh, Department of Cultural Affairs grant. Um, and this particular painting, I'll just jump forward for a minute, references the uh, death of uh, the rapper, former gang member rapper and community activist and entrepreneur Nipsey Hussle, who was shot down um, not far from where I live, but um, in a very different um, reality. Uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, of course, many people would know of as the wonderful poet from the Romantic and Victorian era. She wrote a poem called The Battle of Marathon. Now I'll go back. When she was 14 years old, she wrote this poem about this ancient Greek battle. And some of you may or may not know that Nipsey Hussle had a store on the corner of Crenshaw Slauson called The Marathon. So in referencing his his uh, demise and his sort of mark on the community. I also, uh, I pulled the title of her poem and of course it becomes a hybrid mashup between, you know, a sort of uh, Victorian era sensibility, the sort of neoclassical interest in ancient Greek history and, uh, you know, 21st century urban life and what's happening. And uh, interesting to note, the reason I call this the tale of two 14-year-olds is that Nipsey Hussle was 14, I understand, when he was inducted into the Rolling Crips gang in Los Angeles and, of course, went on uh, to, you know, greatness and changed his life and became a, a wonderful community activist. And Elizabeth Barrett Browning was only 14 when she wrote The Battle of Marathon. And if you read the poem, you will be amazed at <laughs> someone who's 14 had written this poem. And also I think it's interesting to think of her as a poet and him as a poet. You know, many rappers I think of as poets because they're, um, they're speaking to their reality. They're, there's a sense of language, of cadence, of rhythm, and uh, experience. So continuing on, and here comes more of my background as a colorist, this painting called Word Up, Homie, Orange is the Opposite of Blue, Not Red. So it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek, um, you know, I, I just think of when I was making this piece, the absurdity of um, someone being killed for the color they're wearing. For example, um, there was a shooting um, in the area of a young man who was, um, had special needs, was developmentally disabled, was wearing some red sneakers and apparently in the wrong area. So people who like blue and not red shot him and killed him and he was, he was doing nothing wrong. So thinking of it as a painter, you know, trying to make sense of these sort of horrible um, in incidents and crimes in, in my own community that, um, you know, how do you process that as an artist, you know, so I, I went to color theory as a way to say, you know, there's another way of thinking about blue and red and it has nothing to do with killing people. Um, so that's that piece. And then this last piece, Anthem for the Resistance, again, this is part of the COLA series of paintings. Um, 
I thought it had a flag-like look to it. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a stars and stripes, but again, this sort of wonky um, conceptual space that's created by these overlapping floating forms and shapes and, and again, color. One thing that I think is interesting about color is I noticed the, the latter two paintings, that one and that one, were much brighter than this first painting. This is what I was working on when the pandemic hit. And I was actually interrupted. I was almost done with this piece. Um, it was, you know, the beginning of spring, I guess end of winter, beginning of spring. Had to take a couple weeks off and then went back and finished it. Uh, and then got a surge of energy and then was able to complete these other two pieces as well. So that kind of wraps up our little presentation. Holiday. Yeah. So do you work, do you work like paint every day? No, um, you know, I tend to be sort of project oriented. So I know there are some artists who are very disciplined in the sense that they make something every day. And I'm always sort of in awe of them uh, because it seems like a good thing to do. But the reality of how my life is structured and how my workspace is structured is that I work in terms of proce uh, project and, you know, I sort of take half the studio space that I live in. Um, the back half is sort of living area, the front part is work area. So, you know, I sort of clear the decks when it's time to work and it, it takes over my life a lot. So I think that's part of why I work the way I do. Um, even if I'm not painting per se with a brush, I'm always working with my brain. Um, I'm always taking in information and looking and thinking and processing. Um, I write as well. That's something I've been doing on Instagram and in other spaces is just writing thoughts down, ideas. So I think, you know, in a way I work every day, but it's not in the way that you might expect. Um, and also I think just, you know, as a woman, you know, I've, I've got stuff to do. I've got tenants to deal with. I, I'm teaching and, and doing a lot of things <laughs> besides walking the dog. So um, there's only so many hours yeah. of the day. So I try to use my time as well as I can, including when I'm actually working in the studio. So we do have another question from artist Linda King. Um, uh -huh. She wants to know about your process. Do you actually plan out your paintings or do you plan it all out? Do you subtract layers? Is it an additive process? It's um, um, generally, yeah, when I work, I don't plan my paintings. I don't do studies. Uh, very rarely do I do a sketch unless it's of some particular little detail um, that I'm trying to figure something out about. And oftentimes what I end up sketching does not end up in the painting. It's just me working things out in my brain. So what I'll do is, I mean, obviously there's a certain mode I'm working in. So, you know, the last almost decade I've been working in this particular mode with these sort of um, shapes and spaces. There's certain hallmarks of my works like the horizontal and vertical line, uh, the hard edge versus the, um, the gesture, um, areas of pattern, areas that implicate space or imply space, um, and color, color being huge. So when I work, um, especially on these uh, larger paintings, and again, let me go to the very end here, like this. So these large paintings, these are six by nine feet. Um, which is great size because it's big enough to um, feel like you're in the space. A painting like this usually takes about 20 to 25 steps is what I call it. So I'll make a base coat. So in this case, the underlying base coat was that kind of mustard color. Uh, then I did a wash over that. Then within the wash, I did some marks. Then I start applying different blotches and layers of color. So I just do one thing at a time. So perhaps it's painting something green. And then I don't like how the green looks on a lot of the paintings. So I, I cover it with black. And then the black I cover with blue X's. And then the blue X's I add um, spray painted uh, marks in the center of. So I just keep adding and adding and adding uh, until I feel good about it. I use my phone a lot um, just to take pictures of the paintings in process and also to get a little bit of distance, uh, mm -hmm. uh, visual and conceptually um, from the work so that I can really look at the composition and look at how the colors are working, how the shapes and patterns are working together. And believe me, I do make boo-boos. <laughs> so in this painting, I had this brilliant idea to take that fluorescent orange uh, spray paint that you saw in a previous painting 
and make some marks on the uh, left side, kind of underneath where the gold square is. At, on, in the early stages, I did it, and as soon as I did it, I realized it was a huge mistake. <laughs> so um, I had to paint that out and figure out something else. So a lot of times what you see is um, it's me kind of back and forth responding to the painting, um, you know, thinking as a painter, you know, and also it's interesting to note that, you know, uh, there are many artists, especially in Los Angeles, who have a background as street artists who were doing street murals and graffiti. Someone, let, let's say, a Gajin Fujita, um, you know, who's now doing uh, other works in the gallery, but I don't come from that background. So in the, in the world of street art, you know, there's certain styles, there's certain ways of doing things that are actually pretty specific. Um, there's a certain embrace of um, the novel, but, um, you know, it's a very tight community, my understanding anyways. And I'm, you know, I'm a middle-aged woman <laughs> tagging my paintings. I don't go out into the street and make graffiti or do street murals, although I'm kind of interested in taking some of my painting ideas into a street context. So we'll make note of that and we'll see how that develops. But yeah, I'm coming from a very different space. Yeah, I see it. You know, you're kind of coming from the pattern and decoration, but then mm -hmm. these are also landscape paintings, looking yes. at how you even develop the page or the, the canvas with your borders and your layers. I almost feel like it's looking at like a hand-drawn map of a farming community or something. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a couple questions that kind of have come in that talk okay. about, you know, what, okay, so I'm going to just rattle off a few so you can Okay. Talk. Um, the surface, is it flat? Um, the dot pattern, you know, how you're kind of using your dot pattern. Somebody has okay. asked about the little square that sometimes is in the corners, like in the Battle of Marathon, the little square of orange yes. up in the upper, upper corner. Mm -hmm. So why don't you talk about that? Okay, so the patterns um, are generally just um, blotches of spray paint. And, you know, I have different nozzles and things, um, but Generally, I work with what's coming out of the can, and I've learned to manipulate it to get, for example, like in this painting, you see the large blue sort of shape that is me standing fairly close to the canvas and just spraying straight on and holding it for a good amount of time, maybe even 30 seconds to a minute, um, so that I get that sort of halo and I get the drip and a certain size of mark. Whereas the smaller marks that you would see towards the bottom would be you know, a more staccato, a short burst of me just making sprays, standing back, having a look, and then going back in and adding. Um, in terms of the, the gold square, I've had a lot of people ask me about that. Whoops, let me go back. Oops. So you'll notice that these paintings um, have them. This one has it in the bottom right, and this one as well. And you know, it's funny because I initially just had this impulse literally to put the square of gold leaf um, in that painting um, without even particularly knowing why. Um, my instinct told me to do it. And I realized when I was having a studio visit with a, a good friend of mine, very fine abstract painter, Lisa Diane Wedgworth, that the squares were a kind of a, a moment of pause in the chaos, if you will, a safe space uh, conceptually. Uh, something to treasure in, you know, the sort of the jewel in, in the dross, if you will. So they have that kind of representation to me. They're a grounding sort of, um, they have that kind of function within the work, I think. And, and of course, add visual interest and contrast and a sense of, uh, I'll say, asymmetrical balance. Mm -hmm. And so is the, is the surface flat or textured? Um, it's mostly flat. Yeah, it's mostly flat. I mean, you, you know, you can see little bits like where the drips come down. There may be little upraised areas at the bottom where the paint has collected um, and then dried. Um, for the hard edge areas, because I put several layers to get a good thick application of color, then you might see the raised ridges of the edge where the tape has been um, and the paint has been masked. And of course, the gold leaf has its own texture. Uh, when I complete the paintings, I always cover them with several coats of acrylic varnish. These are, by the way, acrylic uh, on canvas, uh, some mixed media with spray paint marker and gold leaf. Um, but uh, they're basically flat, so there aren't like big ridges and they don't have that level of sort of, it, definitely not what I would call impasto or anything like that. 
So are you still using your Carl Benjamin taping technique? Oh, yeah. Technique? Yeah. Carl, I think of him every time I do it, too. Um, and it's something I teach to when I'm teaching, I teach to my students. I mean, it's, it's pretty common knowledge now in terms of how to use it. But of yeah. course, when he was doing it back in the day, it was quite novel. And what I think was especially remarkable was that he was working with oils and doing that, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. Yeah. So Holly, we've come up against our time constraints, but I just want to thank you for being here today. But also, do you want to give a shout out for the class that you're teaching right now at LA City College? Sure. Um, I'm going to be teaching a class in uh, beginning two-dimensional design, uh, which is right up my alley. I haven't taught that uh, type of class for quite some time. It's something I taught at the early stages of my career, so I'm very curious. And also in the new online situation, we'll see how that goes. But I've, I've got some very imaginative and hopefully engaging projects for students. And then um, also want to uh, say thank you to the uh, Newport Beach uh, Public Library Foundation for inviting me to share my work with you and having this lovely conversation. So hopefully um, the viewers enjoyed it. Thank you all for joining as well.